through this Old Testament book, and we have come this morning to the 14th chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 14, and we are going to read together the whole chapter. If you're visiting with us this morning, you're very welcome. It's good to have you here for God's worship. If you don't have a copy of the Word of God, there are some black ones around near the seats, so please make use of those if you want to follow with me as I read to you uh, the Word of the Lord. Deuteronomy 14, and let's commence at the first verse. You are the sons of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves or make any baldness on your foreheads for the dead. For you are a holy people, a people holy to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, you shall not eat any abomination. These are the animals that you may eat, the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roebuck, the wild goat, the ibex, the antelope, and the mountain sheep. Every animal that parts the hoof and has the hoof cloven in two and chews the cud among the animals you may eat. Yet of those that chew the cud or have the hoof cloven, you shall not eat these, the camel, the hare, and the rock badger because they chew the cud but do not part the hoof. They are unclean for you. And the pig, because, it's part, because it parts the hoof but does not chew the cud, is unclean for you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. Of all that are in the waters, you may eat these. Whatever has fins and scales, you may eat. And whatever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat. It is unclean for you. You may eat all clean birds, but these are the ones you shall not eat. The eagle, the bearded vulture, the black vulture, the kite, the falcon of any kind, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the night hawk, the seagull, the hawk of any kind, the little owl and the short-eared owl, the barn owl and the tawny owl, the carrion vulture and the cormorant, the stork, the heron of any kind, the hoopoe and the bat. And all winged insects are unclean for you. They shall not be eaten. All clean winged things you may eat. You shall not eat anything that has died naturally. You may give it to the sojourner who is within your towns that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. And before the Lord your God in the place that he will choose to make his name and dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And if the way is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe when the Lord your God blesses you, because the place is too far from you which the Lord your God chooses to set his name there, then you shall turn into money and bind up the money in your hand and go to the place that the Lord your God chooses and spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice you and your household. And you shall not neglect the Levite who is within your towns, for he has no portion or inheritance with you. At the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it, upon, lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, our loving Father, You reveal Yourself to us in Your Word as the one who is holy. You call us to be a people who reflect Your holiness in the way that we live our lives. We know this is only possible by Your grace through faith in Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We would ask now as we take up Your Word this morning and as we, we consider what you have revealed to us in the Old Testament regarding your relationship with Israel under the Old Covenant, that you would help us to understand its meaning 
and its relevance for our lives. We pray, Father, that Your Word would search us. We pray, Father, that it would lead us to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that it would instruct us in all that would bring honor and glory to You as we look to Your Son, who alone is the only Savior from sin. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In the history of the Christian church, the place of the law in the Christian life has been hotly debated, and I would argue greatly misunderstood. This is why the great controversy of the Protestant Reformation centered upon the matter of how sinful men can be made right with a holy God. And it addresses the place of the law in the Christian life. Historic, orthodox Christianity teaches that the law of God has a threefold use. It teaches us what sin is. It shows us our need for Christ. And it guides us in how to live for Christ. Christ. And as Christians, it's vitally important to understand that we do not gain a right, under, a right standing with God through our obedience to the law, but through believing in Jesus Christ, who, as we were reminded recently by Pastor Steve, has kept the law for us and secured pardon for us as law breakers. However, we must understand as Christians that the law functions for us as a guide with regards to loving God with all our heart and soul and mind and loving our neighbor as our self. This is why understanding the meaning and the application of the law of God as it is revealed in the Old Testament actually helps us understand then how to apply it as Christians in our lives as it comes to us through Him. We must always guard on the one side against legalism that teaches we must keep the law to be right with God, which is wrong, and antinomianism on the other hand, that says there's no requirement to live lawfully once you've been justified. And as we come this morning again to Deuteronomy, to the sermon of Moses that we're looking at here as he preaches to Israel on the threshold of Canaan, we shall address this issue once again. God is concerned here to be instructing His people on how to live for Him once they have taken the promised land. We know that Israel is imminently going to invade Canaan. We know that Moses is leading them, and he is instructing them, and he is guiding them to be prepared once they get into the land how to live for God. Now, so far, Moses has given them instruction in living out the first commandment and living out the second commandment. Here, as we get into chapter 14, we see now he gives them some instruction on how to live out the third commandment. The third commandment is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What first comes to mind when you hear that? You ask yourself, why does no one ever use Muhammad as a swear word? Why does no one ever invoke Buddha as a swear word? Why is it that it is their creator that they blaspheme from their mouth? The reason, of course, being that their heart is not right with him and they are at enmity with Him. You often think, don't you, when it says, do not take the Lord your God's name in vain, that it's to do with your speech. Now, it has, but I want to suggest to you this morning, and I think you will see it from the passage as we walk through it, there's far more to the third commandment than that. Far more to understanding the third commandment than that. Here in Deuteronomy 14, 
I am suggesting to you this morning that the third commandment is, com is connected by Moses to funerals, food, and finances. Pastor Steve's not here this morning, so he wouldn't laugh at my alliteration. But I want you to see this. I want you to understand this. You might say to yourself, well, in what way, Pastor, is this passage addressing the third commandment and its connection to funerals and food and finances? Well, come with me into the passage, and let us consider together this reality. When God commands us not to take His name in vain, He is addressing something far deeper than merely the words that come out of our mouth. He is addressing the manner of our actual lives. He's not merely speaking to the words that we speak. He is addressing the lives that we are actually living. You see, to take God's name is to claim to be God's. Claiming to be a child of God is a serious matter. You're taking God's name upon you. And that's why the passage begins in the way that it does. You are the sons of the Lord your God. Moses is reminding Israel of its identity. Moses is reminding Israel of its blessedness. Verse 2 says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Chapters 12 and 13 have been teaching Israel about God being holy. Now chapter 14 addresses how Israel is to be holy and reflect the character of their father. You are a holy people. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the earth, the face of the earth. Moses is reminding them, isn't he, of the grace that God has extended to them. They are the elect of God. They are the children of God. They are the ones upon whom God has put His name. They are the ones who are taking God's name upon them. That's why what follows then is God addressing the fact that they dare not take His name in vain. They dare not say they are the people of God, they are the children of God, and not live like they are the children of God. For to do that is to take the name of the Lord in vain. And so we see here, that Moses is addressing the third commandment as he's addressing Israel. Why? Because at the very heart of Israel's relationship with God, and at the very heart of Israel enjoying the blessing of God in their life in, in, the, in, in Canaan, is the fact that they live according to the law of God. And in chapter 12 and 13, we've seen then that God instructs Israel about His holiness, and now He's going to start to instruct Israel about its holiness and living before them, before Him. I want you to see three particular truths this morning in relation to the third commandment and how God fleshes it out in the life of Israel, and then we'll draw connections to the New Testament and how it applies to us as the people of God in Christ. Notice, first of all, God's concern regarding death. God's concern regarding death. The first topic that Moses speaks to in this section of his sermon is this topic of death. Moses speaks to Israel about what we might call funeral rituals or funeral ceremonies or ceremonial practices when people die. And notice what he says. You shall not cut yourselves or make any baldness on your foreheads for the dead. Now, I know for some of you this morning, you don't have to do that. The baldness is already there. <laughs> Brother Paul was having a laugh at me. What is he talking about? What is this? He's referring to the Canaanite practices 
The Canaanite rites, the Canaanite rituals that would take place when people would die. They would cut themselves. They would, and they would harm themselves, right? They would shave themselves uh, in response uh, to, to, to death. Uh, and they would engage then in pagan worship in the land when people died. And Moses' concern is that Israel doesn't act like Canaan. That Moses wants the Israelites to understand that they are not to engage in the funeral rites of the pagan. They are not to practice the ceremonies of the pagan when death occurs in their ranks. Reminding them again that the reason is because they are the people of God. They have taken the name of God. They are the loved of God. They are God's people and they are to be different from the pagans. I think that's a message the modern church has lost. It seems to me modern evangelicalism in America says to the church, if you want to win the world, try and be as like them as you possibly can be. That's not what the Bible teaches us. That's not what the Bible teaches us. And all the flattening of distinctions and all the erasing of, of, of understanding the differences you know what it's actually done? It's weakened us to the point of utter ineffectiveness in a lost and perishing world. And here Moses, as he addresses Israel, as he's getting them ready to go into the land of Canaan, he addresses the reality that God is concerned for them regarding how they're going to handle death when they get into the land of Canaan, and he's particularly concerned about the fact that they are not to handle it the way the Canaanites handle it. They are not to address it and, and deal with it the way the Canaanites did. And my dear brothers and sisters, has there anything really changed in that as the covenant people of God under the covenant of grace in Jesus Christ? No. God's people should handle death differently from the world because we are the people of God. God's people should handle death differently from the world because they are the people of God. You see, Moses is concerned with what? Authenticity. Moses is concerned with sincerity. Moses is concerned with genuineness. Moses is concerned with Israel trusting God when death breaks into the ranks, because death will break into the ranks. Why? Because death breaks into every context, because, well, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. The reason why death exists is because of the fall, and we're all under the curse. And we who are the Lord's people, just as Israel was the Lord's people under the old covenant, we are the Lord's people under the new covenant, we are not immune to death. I'm sorry to have to break the bad news to you, but one out of one of us die. That's the statistic. And we have to realize this. We have to be aware of this in our secular age. One of the reasons why much of what's happened with COVID has happened, I believe, is because there's a terror about death. And we don't know how to respond because we're walking in unbelief and we're not trusting the living God. And we know not Jesus Christ. And whilst the old covenant has been fulfilled in Christ, thankfully, the reality is that we need to understand then, well, what's the application for us regarding death as the people of God in Christ? Well, let me give you a couple of encouragements. Turn to John chapter 11, one of my favorite chapters. I might preach on this next Sunday because it's Easter. I may not. But John 11 is one of the most blessed chapters in all of the New Testament. Why? Because it's here that Jesus brings us glorious hope in the face of death. It's here that Jesus declares, I am the way, I am the resurrection, sorry, and the life. And notice what he declares in verse 25. He goes on, he says, Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. My dear brother, my dear sister, meditate on that. Jesus Christ, who has made you a child of God, has lived for you. He has died for you. And he has risen for you. And though you may die, let me say, 
though you will probably die, yet shall you live because of Jesus Christ. What does Christ give the Christian that the non-Christian doesn't have when death comes? Hope. Hope. And if you don't believe me, well, jump across to 1 Thessalonians where the apostle Paul fleshes it out for us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Listen to what Paul says as he's writing to the Thessalonians who are wrestling with eschatological things, that is, end times things. There's a general eschatology, and there's a personal eschatology that we must understand. General is what is cosmic. Personal is what's going to happen to you in the cosmic context. Notice what Paul says, verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers. In other words, he's saying there's not really a place for ignorant Christians. Don't be ignorant about the end. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, but those who are asleep, that is, those who have died in Christ. You see that in graves, right? I'm one of those strange people who takes a walk around graveyards, and I read the headstones, and I wonder, heaven, hell. Heaven, hell. And their gravestones tell you things. I sleep in Jesus. You see that on gravestones. Has sleep in Jesus. I don't know what they're going to put on my tombstone. That'll be up to Elaine if she's still alive or my kids. But the reality is, it tells you something. It tells you something about what people believed. And here's Paul. What does he say? Don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve. He doesn't say at all. He doesn't say at all. Christians don't grieve. No, 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 no. We grieve. That you may not grieve as others do, as the pagans, as the unbelievers do, as those who have no hope. What is the difference for us who are Christians to those who are not Christians when death comes knocking? If we're in Christ, there is hope. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I've buried a number of people over nearly 19 years of ministry here. Those of you who have been in Emmanuel long enough know some of the funerals we've had to have here. Christian funerals, there are tears. Why? It hurts. It's sore. It's painful. We do mourn. God's people do mourn. We recognize that someone has gone from this place. Someone has departed. They will never come back. There is an empty chair. There is a gap in our life. It will never be the same again. It cannot be the same again. We mourn, but we do not mourn as those who have no hope. Those who have gone on before us, we'll see them again. If they're in Christ... They're safe in the arms of Jesus. And oh, how wonderful that is to know because Jesus has lived for us. Jesus has died for us. Jesus has risen for us. And Jesus is coming again for us. And we have a blessed hope in Him. And my dear brothers and sisters, I think in our day with all its secular stuff where funerals are no longer funerals, they're celebrations of life. That's a problem, by the way. Yes, be thankful for the life, but recognize the death. The death has happened because of sin. That is, cosmic judgment has fallen on all of us. We're all going to die. We're all going to die. Recognize that loss is real. The pain is a reality. But recognize Christ, who overcame the devil has lived and died and risen for us. And even though that individual has died, yet shall they live because they have union with Jesus. Listen to me this morning. If you are here and you are not a Christian, if you do not have union with Jesus Christ, you will not be saved when the judgment comes. There is only a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Heaven is only gained by believing in Jesus Christ and Him crucified plus nothing. And hell is obtained 
by not believing in Jesus Christ and living your own way and taking your own chances. There is great hope in being a Christian when death comes. Brothers and sisters, we need to rediscover this. We need to be aware of this. Even I think the way we conduct Christian funerals needs to, needs to in many ways, amplify this for the world. That we talk about the realities of life and death, of heaven and hell, of judgment and redemption. When an unbeliever comes to a Christian funeral, they should know there's something very different going on here than what happens in an unbeliever's funeral. Why? Because in an unbeliever's funeral, there is no hope. I've taken unbelievers' funerals. They're the hardest events to navigate you can imagine. Because your job isn't to place the dead person in heaven and hell. That's God's job. Your job is to try and give hope to the group that are standing looking into the grave and wondering, what in the world is it all about? My dear brothers and sisters, God's people should handle death differently from the world because they are the people of God. And I bless God that we do. I bless God that Many of you have taken funerals for your loved ones, and you've handled death with dignity. You've handled death with faith. Yes, we've wept, and yes, we still weep when we think about it, because it still hurts. It's still hard, but not without hope. Not without the blessed hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So just as Israel were taught by God to go into the promised land and handle death differently from the Canaanites, we in Christ are taught to handle death differently from the world because of Him. Second point. God is concerned regarding food. Wow. This is strange, isn't it? God is concerned regarding food. Verses 3 through 21, the very heart of the whole passage here, back in Deuteronomy 14. What do we discover the heart of this chapter is all about? Well, I'm sorry to have to bring it up again, but it's all about diet. <laughs> okay? Look, I battle with my weight, okay? I hate passages about diets, right? But I've got to preach the whole counsel of God. And God is concerned about diet. At least under the old covenant, he's certainly concerned about it. We'll come to the new in a minute, but here's the reality. The Lord is sovereign over all things. He's the creator over all things, even the very things you put in your mouth or don't. And here in this passage, the Lord is giving Israel more instruction. He's already given them some instruction. He's giving them more instruction. It's a developing instruction about their eating when they get into the land of Canaan. Remember when you're reading your Bible that God didn't give all His truth at once. He gives it in progressive chunks. He tells them this, and then he develops it further, and then he develops it further. That's why at the end of the day, when you read from your Old Testament to your New Testament, it's all going somewhere, right? It's going to fulfillment from promise. Promise in the Old Testament, and Christ is coming. And fulfillment, he has come, right? So when you're reading through these sermons of Moses, you've got to realize that he's building on what he said before, and he's giving them more instruction, and it's developing. And here now we come to this section about food once again. It's not the first time that Moses has mentioned food, right? Israel was well accustomed to the fact that God has a lot to do with food. you know why? Because if he hadn't given them any food in the wilderness, they would have all died. That's why when we come to the Lord's Prayer, what do we have to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. God is interested in our food. Why? Because He's the provider of it. You know, I'm not a hunter, and I'm thankful for Winkle. We mentioned that before. But nevertheless, the reality is that God is the great provider of our food, and God is the Lord over our food. And here we find in this passage, God giving a lot of instruction to Israel regarding their eating. Now, what's really interesting about this passage, if you take time to study it, is that Moses actually addresses the issue of their food in the created order. If you take Genesis 1, and you put it beside Deuteronomy 14, you discover that it's almost as if Moses is reflecting upon what he's written in Genesis 1 the animals of the land, the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air. 
He's actually thinking about the whole created order, and he's thinking about what Israel can do with regards to the whole created order regarding their food. Now, I could keep you here on all the different theories as to why did God give them these instructions? Why could you eat this and not that? Why couldn't you eat that and not this? One of the commentators that I really like the best is, uh, he said this, at the end of the day, we actually just don't know. I'll take that. Some would argue it was hygienic purposes. I think there's an element there. There's merit in that. Some would argue it certainly was had religious connotations. Others will argue it's, mi- it's a mixture. But here's what we discover in this passage, I believe. That one of the reasons, and perhaps even a primary reason, why God is concerned with Israel's food is that He wants to use even the very mundane reality of food in their life to remind them you're my people. You're not like the pagans. You're my children. You behave differently. You take my name. This is what you need to do to show that to the world. That there is indeed a religious reason that separates Israel as holy unto the Lord. So that when other nations would look at Israel, they would ask the question, why do those Israelites eat that and not that? Why do those Israelites not eat this and they eat that? Well, it's because they are Yahweh's people. They are the people of God. And people would be caused to ask, who is this God? Well, He's the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, the judge of all things, the God before whom all men will stand on the final day. And so here is Israel receiving these instructions. We're not going to go through them all. There's a very interesting list, isn't it, regarding uh, the the animals, regarding the fish, uh, regarding the birds. But what we discover is this, that they are to take heed to their diet so as to show indeed that they are the people of God. They are to show to the world that they take seriously taking the name of God. They are not to take the name of God in vain. They are not to pretend they are the people of God and ignore God. They are to take God seriously. They are to heed God's Word genuinely. They are not to behave even down to the very details of their diets like the pagans. Notice verse 21. It basically sums it up for us. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Now, I don't know about you, but one thing I am glad about living under the new covenant, not under the old covenant, is that I don't have to worry about this at one level. I just go and buy my meat and enjoy it. Now, it's true, there are some things I'm not really keen to eat. And I look at this list, and I'm thinking, I'd never want to eat that anyway, right? But nevertheless, what it does show us is this, that God's people should handle even their diet, even their food, differently from the world. First of all, Our Lord, and I've alluded to it already, teaches us as His disciples, what? That you depend on God even for your meals. Now, I understand preaching to us millionaires in the history of the world, right, where we've got every supermarket you can imagine, and every gourmet supermarket, and every gourmet, gourmet, gourmet supermarket, and all the rest of it, that it's almost kind of like, whoa. But let's be honest, brothers and sisters, do we take the name of the Lord our God in vain? In this sense, that we just assume the food will be there, and we never ever really ask God to provide it, and we never ever really thank Him for having done it. Wow. One of the things I love when I'm in a restaurant is to look across the room and see another couple of people bow their head, thank their God for the food they're about to eat. Teach your children that, mums and dads, right from the very get-go. Give thanks to God. You're training them to realize, you know what? Even the very meat you put in your mouth, you are dependent upon God to receive. Jesus addresses food right in the heart of the Lord's prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Mundane, yes. 
practical, of course, challenging us not to take the Lord's name in vain. In other words, pretend that we're trusting Him when we're not really trusting Him. We're just trusting ourselves. But there's much more, did you know, in the New Testament regarding food for Christians to consider? Now, we have time to get into all, but I just want to jump into one book, and I want to show you three texts. First Corinthians, where they had some real challenges regarding food, regarding eating meals together, regarding even the Lord's Supper, which, by the way, is about food, set apart for a holy use, right? First Corinthians chapter 5. Here we have a classic example of someone who's taking the Lord's name in vain. What are they doing? They're saying, I'm a Christian, but I'm living sexually immoral. That is someone taking the Lord's name in vain. Hypocrisy is taking the Lord's name in vain. Saying that you believe this, living like you, you actually believe that. And here we have it. And what does Paul say to the church? You see, the church is saying, oh, we are so loving, we're so kind, we can, we can tolerate the sexual immorality in our midst. Paul says, no, 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 no. That's not God-honoring. That's not God-honoring. Notice verse 1. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. You see, this is a, there's a contrast going on here. Paul's thinking about the covenant community of God. He's thinking about the world. And he's saying, Christians, you're not to be like the world. You're to be different. You're to live a different life. Why? Because you're under different management. And then he goes on. And he talks about them boasting, verse 6, that they're tolerating this in the ranks. And he warns them, tolerate sin in the ranks of the church. It will soon spread and you won't have a church. And then he goes on. And what does he say? Verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now, who is he talking about? He's not talking about just everybody in the world that you have to mix with at work. That's not the context. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters since you would need to go out of the world. No, I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother who takes the name of the Lord in vain. You're not to associate with them if they're guilty of living a life contrary to the gospel. Now, brothers and sisters, that's not easy, is it? Some of us actually think we're smarter than God. Some of us actually think that we understand things better than God. Well, I know that we had to excommunicate that brother, but I'm still going to meet with him regularly. It doesn't say that here. It says, actually, you're to draw back. They need to feel the draft socially. They need to realize now, we won't affirm your Christianity. We're not having this. You can't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, and we will be okay with that. You see, we live in a society that, and in the church that thinks, well, I know better than God. I'm more loving than God, you know. I can do this. And I think I can win them. Look, in Titus, as Pastor Steve reminded us, or he will remind us, after the second admonition, have nothing to do with them. Who are you to say you know better than God and you think the third and the fourth admonition is actually going to be better? When the Holy Spirit has said, after the second, no more. Leave them to God. Do you believe the Holy Spirit can convict them? Do you believe the Holy Spirit can bring them to an end of themselves? Then obey the Lord, leave them to the Lord. Do not even, what does it say? Eat with such a one. Yes. Don't even go to Starbucks. Have a cup of coffee. You say, no, I'm sorry, I really have to remind you right now, you need to repent. You need to trust in Jesus. Then we can go to Starbucks. Then you can go for a burger. Sure, then you can come back into the church. And sit at the Lord's table with us. But until then, you don't get to claim to be a Christian and live like a pagan and have me affirm it. I'm not going to do it. I don't care how much you think I don't love you. That's actually love in the Bible's eyes. That's actually love in the Bible's eyes. 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 8. It's not over. Food offered to idols. 
What are we dealing with here? That we're to be sensitive to what? The consciences of one another. What is the world's attitude? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Who cares? What is the Christian's attitude? As my brother had some issues with conscience over food worship offered to idols, then I'm going to refrain for the sake of love. I'm going to not eat what they can't eat with a good conscience that it might cause them to stumble. You see, even eating food comes under the rubric of loving one another. This falls into the whole realm of the alcohol debate. This falls into the whole realm of the fact that if people come to your home and they are on a diet, you should respect that. You should try to accommodate it. Now, I understand. It's not easy. Hospitality can be a challenge, and it's easy to just invite the people that it's easy to just make meals for and let all the crazy diet people just meet somewhere else. I understand that. Look, I'm a pastor, right? I've been here for 30 years. I'm pastor, you people, right? I know, right? I got a weird diet, right, these days, but it's helping. I mean, let's be honest, okay? But the reality is, the reality, there's a temptation, isn't there? There's a temptation. It's hard. It really makes, it's a real effort to love your brother and your sister, right? You've got to prepare. You've got to be intentional. This is what we're called to, brothers and sisters in Christ. Not just write people off, not just have nothing to do with them, but actually step forward and seek to love them for the glory of God and for their conscience, and yes, even for their waistline. 1 Corinthians 8 addresses that issue of food. And then we come to 1 Corinthians 11. It's the Lord's Supper, and it's the issue of eating before the poor get in so the poor don't get anything and Really, the issue is they're not united around the Lord's Supper, are they? And Paul warns them that you can perform the Lord's Supper, but you know what? You're really taking the Lord's name in vain when you perform it without actually addressing the issues that it's meant to address. You know what the issues of the Lord's Supper are? Your renewed repentance towards the Lord and towards your brothers and sisters. There's two elements to the Lord's Supper. There's the upward element, and there's the land element, right? There's the vertical, the horizontal, right? And we're called to keep short accounts with each other at this fellowship meal for the glory of God and the unity of the church and the peace between us. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, isn't it interesting? We're thankful we don't have to go through all the rigmaroles of the diet of the old covenant, but in Christ, there's still a lot to consider. There's a lot to consider regarding food and how we fellowship and how we get together and how we relate to one another. It's not been abandoned, but it has been changed. But it has an impact. And that brings us to the last thing. God's concern regarding wealth. God's concern regarding wealth. Go back to Deuteronomy 14, and what do we discover in verses 12 or in verses uh, 22 to the end of the chapter, God begins to address the issue of tithing, the issue of what we do with our wealth. There are two elements here, verses 22 through 27 deal with the regular tithe, the annual tithe uh, from their, the provisions that God had given them. The people were to learn to fear the Lord and bring to the Lord the first fruits and the firstborn uh, and, and the tithe of all that they had. And then there's the, the, after the regular tithe, which is 22 to 27, you have at the end of the chapter the, the irregular triennial tithe. Verses 28 through 29, every three years there's to be another kind of tithe that they're to have, and it's to particularly be towards what? Towards addressing the issues of the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow who are within their towns. Again, the old covenant's fulfilled, brothers and sisters, in Christ, right? Some of you ask me sometimes, should you be giving a tithe of your, giving, a, a tithe of your provision to, or your, your prosperity to the Lord? I, I, the New Testament doesn't demand a tithe. It demands more. Be generous. Cheerful giver. We're going to see this. In fact, give everything you can, right? The pagan nations, what did they do with their wealth? They just basically squandered it on themselves. They basically used it for their own benefit. Israel was to be concerned as a nation uh, with regards to its wealth to use it for the glory of God. Use it for the kingdom of God. Use it for the poor and the needy. 
And brothers and sisters, we need to see this. God's people should handle wealth differently from the world. You realize that everything you've been given has come from God anyway. God ultimately owns it all. And the minute He decides to take away your breath, He will do that, and you don't take any of it with you. He's given it to you, and He can take it away from you whenever He chooses. I know we don't live that way, but that's reality. My father died a number of years ago now, and I'll never forget the impact it had in many ways on my life. But one of the ways that it had an impact on me was to realize that 77 years doesn't amount to very much when it comes to your stuff. I think it was like 10 or 11 bags of my dad's clothes and stuff my brother and I took to the charity shop, right? I remember taking it with my brother. We're all Christians in our family, so you know, if dad had been back there, I'd been joking with him about it. You know, why have you got all these shoes, dad? Why have you got all these shirts? Right? But the reality is it doesn't amount to very much. It really doesn't. Those of you who've had loved ones and you've had to clear their homes, those of you who've had loved ones and you've had to remove their stuff, you realize it doesn't amount to very much. And yet, we hold on to it like it matters to death. And we need the Lord to help us here, don't we? We need the Lord to help us. Just like the food laws in the Old Covenant, the tithing laws of the Old Covenant are all fulfilled in Christ. But listen, it doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't have His rule over our wealth. Turn to Acts. See how the church conducts itself when the Spirit of God comes after that great sermon by Peter. Acts chapter 2, one of our favorite texts, isn't it? Because it summarizes what we're about even here this morning in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. God wants us to share as Christians. Now, I know. I see it on IBC Social. I know that some of you love to share. Not always sure of what it is you're sharing. It's always quite interesting to me what people are giving away in the church. I'm amused at times. Quite funny. Sometimes I think I would quite like that. But I don't really need that. But here's the reality. It is good that we share of our stuff, of our money, of our possessions. If I have two of something and you have none of something and I can give it to you, the Lord be blessed, praised, right? The Lord be praised. This is what God's concerned about amongst his people. Under the new covenant, in Christ, the community of the saints is to be a sharing community. I know some of you are going to say, wait a minute, pastor, it sounds a bit like communism. That's what you've got to be careful when you're in America because, you know, everybody's concerned for that, right? I understand I'm not a communist. Somebody said I'm a European socialist, but that's a different issue. Here's the point. Here's the point. God is concerned about what you're doing with your stuff. He is concerned about what you're doing with your money. He is concerned about whether or not you're meeting the needs of the people of God around you. And we see this, Galatians 2. Turn there just for a minute. Because, you know, we're going to skip over the scary passage, Acts 5, right, which we could have looked at regarding Ananias and Sapphira, right, when you really don't deal with your wealth properly. You know, God ain't impressed. But let's jump over that one. Galatians 2, verse 10. The apostle Paul up in Jerusalem, talking about his ministry. He's heading out to preach the gospel. It says in verse 10, the, the other apostles asked us to remember the poor, the very thing they were eager to do. Now, the poor here is the poor in the church, right? There's no way the church can meet all the needs of every poor person in the streets of Sacramento, and we're not actually called to do that. But we are called to do this. If there's a poor member amongst us who really has a need, we are called to meet that need. We are. Many years ago, my first pastoral ministry, there was a lady, and she'd had a really hard time, 
Her husband had been abusive. He put a gun in her mouth one night. He was going to blow her head off. He was a police officer. He was, he was bad. She had four boys. She had to run. She ended up in the church I was pastoring. I went to visit with her. She was on social welfare. She was really struggling. And I remember noticing that there was no carpet on the stair in her house. Just bare floor. She said, Pastor, I don't have any money. I, I can't afford this. Well, I had a couple of pretty wealthy guys in my church. This is a bold 26-year-old pastor, right? I'm not saying that I would maybe do it quite the way I did it this time, but it was still effective. I went to these men and said, hey, you guys are really well off, aren't you? We got a church member with no carpet. Could you have that sorted out for next week? And to their credit, not a problem. Those men had carpet on that dear sister's floor. And all up the stairs, I didn't even realize there was no carpet upstairs. The boys were sleeping in the bedrooms with no carpet. And I had guys in my church who were driving the flashiest cars you could imagine. I just said to them, hey, you know, I'm not making any judgments. I'm not saying that it's been, you know, you guys are bad guys, but you're going to be good guys now, aren't you? Fix it. <laughs> right? That's it. Get it done. Share. Share. Use your wealth for the good of others. This is what we're called to in Christ. This is what we need to understand. There will be people in our church who are not well off. There will be people in our church who have got needs. Now, it's true, you need a lot of discernment between the people who will be the takers and the people who will be uh, the, the people who don't want to work and all the rest of it. We have to work through all of that. But there are genuine needs amongst us. Now, I'm thankful, I can say this with judgment day honesty, that we are, by the grace of God, a generous congregation. You've been very generous to me over nearly 19 years, been your pastor. I have no complaints, only praise, and I mean that. And I know that you are doing things that I don't even know about, and I bless God for that. So there's no, I'm not preaching this because I think we need to do better or anything like that. I'm preaching this because this is what's in the text. But I am reminding us, keep on keeping on, brothers and sisters. This is what it means to be Christians. Very delighted that just recently I heard of a couple who have come to our church and someone provided a vehicle for them. Praise the Lord! That that was done. That's the application. Where there's a need, if we can meet it, brothers and sisters, amongst each other, meet the need. And even more than the need, go beyond it if you can. Go beyond it if you can. Second Corinthians. Jump there just for a minute as we draw things to a close. Listen to the Apostle Paul. Right into the Corinthians, he says this in verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. What's Paul saying? He said, look, these people had nothing, and yet they were generous with their nothing as much as they could to give to the needs of the church at large. They gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you and I want to commend you for the giving that has taken place amongst us for the work of the gospel in Ukraine. We made a plea. You stepped up. You showed your character to God be the glory. See, sometimes in a sermon, a pastor's got to remind his church of the good things they're doing too. Very important. Brothers and sisters, this is what it means to be a Christian church. That we recognize that God's people should handle their wealth differently from the world. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a, con a pastor of a large congregation, as you, many of you know. He had a very good salary for the day in which he lived. Something like 20 or thousand pounds a, a, a year was his salary back in the 1850s. I don't know what that computes at, but it's quite a lot. When he died, the total of his estate, his estate now, out of 30 or 40 years of earning 20,000 a year in Victorian England, the total of his estate was $2,000. Say, what? What do you do with all this money? Well, let me tell you. 800 pastors trained for ministry. Orphanages opened all over London. Book ministry. Missionaries. He gave it all away in the work of the gospel. That's why we still talk about Spurgeon. 
because he invested his wealth in the kingdom of God. And we bless God's name that we have a beneficiary of that. You've got a beneficiary of that right here this morning, me. You say, what? Yeah. I came to maturity in the faith in a church in Scotland that was planted by a 77-year-old church planter, David Tate, in 1933, planted the church. His name is in Spurgeon's book. He was one of the students at the Spurgeon's College. Isn't that amazing? And when you ever get a chance to see my office over there, and there's a picture on the wall of Spurgeon, it was the last picture ever taken of him. And I found it in a cupboard when I was 19 years old with my pastor in Scotland. It was ripped, it was torn. And he was thinking, Rob, what can we do with this? I said, it will hang on my wall when I'm a pastor. And Elaine put a frame on it when I was about 25 years old. I would not give that away for a million dollars, two million dollars, three million dollars because of the value it has to me connected with one of the greatest prince of preachers in the history of the church. You see, when you invest in the kingdom with all your wealth, with all you've got, you're never disappointed. You're never disappointed. In a day when so many think that the world will be won to Christ by being as like the world as possible, it's clear that God's Word teaches the other, teaches the opposite. As those who are redeemed of the Lord, brothers and sisters, whether it was the old covenant or it's the new covenant, funerals, food, and finances all come under God's jurisdiction. And the world will know that we are set apart for God in the way that we handle death, in the way that we handle even what we eat, in the way that we handle our wealth. Brothers and sisters, let us be committed in this place continually not to take the name of the Lord our God in vain. Amen. Let's pray. Father, how wonderful is your word, how searching it can be, how sweet it is for us to know that in Christ the law has been fulfilled, and through him the righteous requirement of it is able to be fulfilled in us. We bless you and we praise you this morning that you are our God, that we are your people. We thank you that you have saved us out of the world, but we know, Lord, we still have to live in the world. And so we pray for the grace of your Spirit to enable us to live as your true children, even by the way we address those basic realities of our lives death, money, even what we put in our mouths. O oh Lord, may it be that the world would see that we are the children of God and that we do not take your name in vain by the way that we conduct our lives before them. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.